Well, Wedful, this is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful Richard Vegg. Richard, are you ready to do this? I am, and it's such a privilege to be with you. Well, excited to have you on. And Richard, this will be our monthly book club. So welcome again. Tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and what motivated you to put pen to paper on your third book, your fourth book. This is actually my fifth, believe it or not. I don't know when to stop. <laughs> so, so Richard, uh, go ahead. It, it, um, uh, my wife and I have six kids. We live here in Philadelphia. Um, they're all pretty much grown up at this point in time. I've been a banker uh, for most of my career. For the last three years, I've actually served in the cabinet of the governor of Pennsylvania as his secretary of banking and securities. And I kind of got started on writing these books, which are you know about the economy coming out of the great financial crises. This is something that no one saw. Uh, it hurt millions of people. Even today, I think conventional economists uh, have not uh, really been able to, to speak to it in a way that's convincing. Uh, so that's been the basis of my work, to try to bring a uh, new perspective to that. And I appreciate that. Um, so debt, oftentimes when we think about debt, I think we think about government debt. But that's not what you are approaching with 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 the new book. And shame on me, I've, I've I did a pretty bad job introducing you. The new book is uh, "The Paradox of Debt: A New Path for Prosperity and with Without Crisis." Let me try that again. "Paradox of Debt: A New Path to Prosperity Without Crisis." Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, people immediately start thinking about government debt whenever the conversation comes up. And we, of course, had the most recent debt ceiling crisis in Washington, D.C. But there's actually far more private sector debt than government debt. In the U.S., private sector debt is about $40 trillion. In the U.S., it's uh, government debt is about $30 trillion. If you look at it globally, Private sector debt is about 150 trillion, and government debt is only about 90 trillion. And private sector debt is the debt of households and businesses uh, added together, and it's the bigger issue. And you know, we were just talking about the crisis of 08. The crisis of 08 obviously was something where we piled on five trillion dollars in mortgage debt. A lot of that very inappropriately. And, uh, you know, that crisis, as I just mentioned, is the one that kind of got me interested in digging deeper into the subject of debt. There's no way I would have guessed that private sector debt is greater than public sector debt. Well, and you're, you know, you're, you know, a very sharp individual. So <laughs> if you don't know, right, uh, just think about, you know, the, the, the masses of folks, but, um, you know, there's 13 to 14 trillion dollars in mortgage debt alone. Uh, and then you start adding from there. So it's about 40 trillion dollars worth of private sector debt in the United States. And it's a pretty high number and it weighs down the economy. So, uh, you know, we, you know, we've talked, I think, a lot about student debt. And we had the you know recent announcement that a Biden effort to try to do something about student debt was unsuccessful. But you know, as I've gone around the country, uh, you know, it, it's not just 20 year olds that have student debt. Well, I met plenty of 60 and 70 year olds that are still trying to pay off their student debt. So private sector debt is pervasive. It seeps into every corner of our lives. And it's an it's a subject we need to pay a lot more attention to. And that's frankly one of the purposes of my book. Why do we need to pay more attention to it? Well, it's, you know, it, I call private debt the paradox because debt does two things kind of at the same time. It it creates wealth. I mean, using debt as a way to buy a house that might appreciate in value. It's a way to buy stocks that uh, might appreciate in value. But it's also something that can get you into trouble if you overpay for something or if you borrow to spend rather than invest, 
So I call death the creator and the destroyer. You know, it's a paradox and it's something that we need to look at very carefully, not just individually. I mean, we obviously need to look at it in our own personal lives and do what we can to manage it appropriately. But we need to look at it economy wide to see what the trends in the economy uh, are going to be. Makes sense. In your role as you are the Secretary of Banking and Securities for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, what what does that mean? Well, I mean, I just retired as Governor Wolf uh, ended his term, and uh, but our job was to regulate banks, to make sure banks were healthy, to license and oversee in securities firms, including your friendly registered investment advisor that uh, you know is your corner, what we used to call a stockbroker, uh, and and these are the folks that. I must say, did not really do the right job in the state of California. For those of you guys who who saw the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, so my counterpart in California, you know, was the individual who was supposed to be watching over that and making sure it didn't happen, and it obviously did happen. So, uh, be, being a regulator of financial institutions is an important thing for the economy. Yeah important challenging maybe even impossible but well you know it, you know if you think of you know in my lifetime you know there's been a banking crisis of some sort every you know 10 to 20 years so you know there was in in my own lifetime there was a major financial institution crisis the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s uh, folks that are, you know, my age certainly remember that. That was kind of punctuated the end of the Ronald Reagan era. Uh, there was obviously the 08 crisis. We, we've we had debt in and around this most COVID, recent COVID crisis. Uh, the PPP loans were a big part of it. So, uh, yeah, uh, regulating, observing, analyzing debt, I think is a neglected art and something that we need to focus a great deal more on. And that's really what the paradox of debt is in part about. And I think it's a perfect title because it very clearly is a paradox. And on one hand, the the government is interested in a, having a robust economy where the citizens can can be successful and, and flourish and pursue their hopes and their dreams. And they want to make sure that we folks don't get too far over our skis and like over consume and have that debt crush us. Well, that was clearly on uh, President Biden's mind when he was trying to, you know, address the student debt crisis. I do want to say one thing about government debt, though, that I think folks will find uh, interesting and counterintuitive. And that is uh, if you look at the three years of the COVID crisis, 2020, 21, and 22, the government obviously spent a lot of money trying to repair the economy. And um, as a result, public sector debt increased by $6 trillion in just that three-year period. And I think instinctively, a lot of folks kind of would say, oh my goodness, you know, it's increased by $6 trillion. What do we do? What happened to the economy uh, isn't that going to create all sorts of problems for us? Well, one of the fascinating things is that growth and debt actually brought wealth to the household sector. And in the very three-year period that private or that government debt increased six trillion, household wealth increased by thirty-one trillion dollars. Hmm. And that was the government's payment to households that went into household checking accounts. But also the flood of money that came from the government increased the values of real estate and stocks. The stock market and the real estate market went up tremendously during this three-year period. Even with the reversal in 2022 that you know we briefly wrung our hands about. So um, the 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 irony here is 
growth in debt can increase asset values. And I think, you know, you have asked George a, a little bit about how do we apply this personally. Well, one thing that I would tell our audience here is that 70% of all household wealth is in the form of just two things, real estate and stocks. So, you know, the folks that benefit in periods like this are the folks that own real estate and own stocks. And it's very clearly the case, while it's not true for every single person, on the whole, increases in household wealth really relate to just those two things, stocks and real estate. So one of the things I think from a you know personal application standpoint, folks need to do is focus on acquiring those kind of assets and holding those kind of assets over time. When you now look back and say, oh, $6 trillion increase in that three years in public sector debt, that led to $31 trillion of, of an increase in personal wealth. Do you think that that was by design? Is that a happy coincidence? They luck out? Well, it's very interesting because I don't think too many focus people focus on this phenomenon. But, you know, we, we look and we spend some time in the book talking about this. And I think that folks that read the book will find this of interest. But debt as a percent of GDP was pretty flat from the period of 1950 to 1980. But the household wealth to GDP was also pretty flat during that 30-year period. And something that we call in the book the Great Debt Explosion really began in 1981. Total debt to GDP in 1981 was 125%. Today, it's 260%. So in that 43 year, 42 year period, it's more than double. Well, in that exact same period, household wealth has gone from 350% of GDP to almost 600% of GDP. So not quite a doubling, but a massive increase in household wealth. So you know, you ask the question, do you think that, you know, that was by design? Well, I, I think perhaps in some people's mind, to a certain extent it was, but I think most folks, you know, aren't really aware of this correlation. The more debt there is, the more wealth there is. Uh, now, I, I got to footnote that before, you know, before folks get carried away with that idea. The other thing that's true is more debt creates greater inequality because it's really the debt of some that feeds the wealth of others. So through that same period, we'd have a great divergence and a great increase in the inequality among households in the United States. Again, that which feeds us destroys us kind of a thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, you know, folk, there's certain folks that want to vilify debt in one camp. There's certain folks that want to laud debt in the other camp. The very title of this book gets to the fact that it's both, you know, a, a creator and destroyer at the same time. And the book really gets into why that is, what the explanation is, and how we should view that and how we can take advantage of it. Like riding a bull, Richard. You know, I'm going to have to borrow that phrase from you. That's so <laughs> You can have it. Yeah. So, like all of life, it's kind of like riding a bull. Yeah. It's it, fascinating. I, I am by no means an economist. And I just admitted at the top that I didn't realize that private sector debt was more so than public, was more than public sector debt. So I think that that's from a level setting perspective. That being said. You know, I, I read about things like monetary, modern monetary policy, and that doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to me. And you just laid out that it was pretty flat from 50 to 80, 1950 to 1980. And then over the last 40 years, um, it's things have exploded, the amount of debt, but also the amount of wealth. So again, paradox. Absolutely. You know, the, the you know, you know, I guess one thing that, you know, to focus on, and you referred to modern monetary theory, 
which, you know, I think is informs a little bit of this book and what I do. But, you know, when the government spends money, it doesn't disappear. It goes into household checking accounts. So, you know, uh, you know, I think a lot of times folks talk about government debt, you know, government deficits as being all bad. But somebody is the beneficiary of that. And I, I, that's one of the ideas we explore in the book. Right. Does not just wind up in some rich person's pocket. It goes back into the the greater economy and is circulating around. So, so you you mentioned from an individual standpoint, the more we can be participants in the real estate market, the stock market, buying assets of some kind that is for the better. You and your experience in the Commonwealth of Philadelphia versus counterparts in other states. Is there something that you wish that, or perhaps what do you know that 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 you wish more people knew? It's probably a long list well, of stuff. I but. think it's uh, the, these very things. You know, a key to wealth building is simply to to buy and hold uh, long term assets like stocks and real estate. You know, and that requires discipline in terms of you know putting aside some money. It also requires patience in terms of being willing to hold over a longer uh, period of time, but uh, there's no tricks, there's no magic, there's no shortcut. You know, our book really points out that this is where household wealth resides. Uh, and I think that's one of the lessons you can take away from it. It's, you know, we, we don't, we you know in this book, we really roll up our sleeves and, you know, get to the core facts. We don't talk about exotic things, mysterious things. We're, we get in and look at the hardcore things. And uh, I think folks will come away from, from the book with a really deep appreciation of what the real building blocks of the economy are. I appreciate that. So your fifth book, tell us a little bit about your 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 writing process. It's something you do every day. Tell me a little bit about that. It's absolutely something you have to do every day. You know, we it's it's like the the assignment you got in, you know. In junior of high school English, you know, where you had a, a term paper or a big writing project. If you if you waited till the night before, you know, <laughs> it was panic time. If if on the other hand you you did a little bit every day, it was an easy thing. And uh, you know, that's what I try to do. I try to write, you know, for no less than 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, no matter whether I feel like it or not, and no matter whether what I'm writing is dross or not. Uh, I, you know, I finished this book. I'm working on my sixth book right now, which is a biography of one of the uh, banking pioneers that was in Philadelphia and, and a, you know, a, a peer of Washington and Franklin and Jefferson and all those guys. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if I got to sit down every day, I got to read a little, study a little, write a little, uh, and, you know, if you wake up after a few months, you, you've got a few, you've got a lot of words on the page and you've got a real healthy start toward a book. I heard, I, I heard, I recently heard that Jack London, who, you know, Jack London of Call of the Wild fame and White Fang fame, uh, had a rule that he wrote a thousand words a day before he did anything else. I don't quite measure up to that standard, but you know, that's a good goal. Yeah. Well said. So when somebody picks up a copy of, or picks up their copy of the paradox of debt, what are you hoping that they take away? Well, I hope they have a good grounding in what the debt picture of the economy is really like. I don't think you can understand economic trends uh, unless you understand what a pivotal role debt plays in it. And I think this will give folks kind of the ABCs, the blocking and tackling around debt so that, you know, as they move forward in their economic lives, when they hear or read something about government debt or student debt or mortgage debt, they have a context for it. And they, they will understand it in a way that I think most folks don't when they read uh, stories today. And I got to tell you, you know, we have become very knowledgeable over about 15 years and all the nuances of debt. You know, we study it deeply every day. And, you know, we've gotten to the point where when we see a headline, we often chuckle because 
you know, we, we, you'll you'll see somebody who and report some number on credit card debt or student debt, and the headline will either be alarming or excited or something. And more often than not, they've really come to the wrong conclusion. You know, they'll have you know some increase in credit card debt, which they you know they they act like the sky is falling, but if you understand debt the way we present it in this book and you understand the context of it, you can look at the number and say, oh, that's not that big of a deal one way or the other. So you know, I, I think you, if, you, if, you, if you read our book, you'll have a perspective on the economy that, that's uh, quite important and quite helpful. Well, I certainly appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Richard, and thank you for taking those 15, 20, 30 minutes or hour every day to be writing. We're all better off because of it. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they get their copy of Paradox of Debt? Well, you know, you can get it on uh, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the, the usual places. There's We actually have a web, website for the book, paradoxofdebt.com. And then I have my own website, richardvague.com. So any of those places will get you there. Excellent. Well, if you enjoyed as much as I did, show Richard your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Get your copy of Paradox of Debt wherever you buy your books. You can also go to paradoxofdebt.com and also richardvag.com, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-V-A-G-U-E.com and jump into the world of all things Richard. Thanks again, Richard. I'm really grateful to you and sure enjoyed the visit. Until next time, remember, do your part by doing your best. Bye-bye.